I grew up in Kentucky, not too terribly far from the Indiana border. It only takes five minutes to cross into their territory, but like a lot of borders, it might as well be a portal to another world. That's why for four days, I'm planning on ambling around this state and dropping in on some of the basketball happenings in the kingdom of night, Katy, and the Big O. I'm going to cruise through the pastures and rolling hills that produced Bird, Bailey, the Rain Man, and Zebo to try to take the temperature of basketball in the Hoosier State. Our first stop is a bit of a jog to the northeast, to Terre Haute, Indiana, which is the home of the Indiana State Sycamores. I've never been here before. The love for sycamore basketball is still visible, but the success has been infrequent in the 45 years since Bird migrated on to legendary status. ISU has only reached the tournament twice, in the early aughts and again in 2011, and they've only won over 20 games six times during that span. Two of those 21 seasons have come under Josh Schertz, who's in his second year at Indiana State. Schertz is a newer name on the landscape of Division I basketball. This is his first job at this level, but he brings a proven pedigree with him from Division II. This team is tops in the country in cutting efficiency, partly because they shoot the ever-loving shit out of the ball from three and justifiably take a lot of them. The other reason is a single person, and the ultimate reason why we decided to come here. It's Avila. So ah, it's like a mix of the two, so it's A V L. It's A V L. Okay, Avila. It's A V. Okay, I'll be Spotting overlooked talent is instrumental in helping a smaller school punch above their weight class and build notoriety as a program. And the Sycamores clearly succeeded in doing that when they identified the undeniable talent of Robbie Avila. This 6'9 center, who was considered a two-star player out of high school, is now, in my opinion, the most dynamically skilled front court player in college basketball. Avila has also drawn attention for obvious reasons. His accessories draw opponents into a, let's call it a false sense of security. He uses highly deliberate pace to pull defenders into his world, and his blend of angular scoring and passing make that an uncomfortable experience. But I think over the last year, you know, as I had spent time in the system with shirts, I was able to kind of slow the game down a little bit more mentally. And that's where I think I was able to use my obviously slower, you know, abilities uh, to kind of to my advantage and to, to be able to read somebody. It doesn't matter if he's going, you know, two times faster than me because I'm able to, you know, almost predict, you know, what I should do next. And it's kind of just uh, helped me out. You know, I always talk about, you know, being one step slower or even two steps slower than guys. You know, everybody expects you to be one. But when you go two steps slower than a guy, then you're throwing them off even in time. They're in jail. And so, yeah, you got to be jail. You got you to fit your own will. And so uh, being able just to use my, my, my patience and, you know, my own pace, you know, no matter what, has uh, definitely helped me, you know, take my game to another level. So you joke a lot about the slow. Mm -hmm stuff you're getting more attention all the time you know this because you're a good player but you know there's the, the glasses thing Do you, how aware of you how aware of you of like the, the the conversation about like your uniqueness as a player yeah no i see it all over social media it's just i don't i don't look the part or whatever they say you know obviously the you see a big guy with goggles you know it's just it's just you know it's not your average basketball player how do you respond to being underestimated or do you have because you're a chill guy mm -hmm. but do you have kind of an internal What's what's beneath the? Is there is there like a raging competitive volcano? Do you, do you how do you respond to people underestimating you? Uh, I, I kind of just allow them to think what they think. You know, I've been <laughs> yeah. I've been overlooked ever since I was younger, and you know, uh, I just. I'm not one of those guys that, you know, uses that to like get hyped, you know, get extra, you know, aggressive and stuff like that. I'm kind of more of a guy that stays calm, you know, no matter what. And uh, I allow them to, you know, allow them to have their own, you know, opinions or whatever they think, you know, but I'm going to do what I want to do on the court and show you why you're wrong. And the fans are going crazy inside the home center. Uh, I made cookies for everybody. It took mere seconds for us to meet Vicky Weger, known usually as Miss Vicky, who let us know immediately that she was the team mom. Her colorful style forecasted her colorful personality, and I knew that we had found our liaison for this program in this community. She launched into stories of past lives, working as a news producer for NBC, and she painted a vivid and detailed picture of Terre Haute history, what it was like to be here to witness Larry Legend, how the town playfully warred with Steve Martin, and how to effectively throw a hot dog at a ref. I felt like this was a good chance to understand what made this place tick. Sure. What are the duties of the team mom? I get their mama's favorite recipes for them and make their dinners for them. And they come over and watch TV and 
swim and play basketball and get in a hot tub and get over being away from home. Yeah. It's not easy. So you've got a big family. I mean, you, You're not kidding. You keep in you keep in touch with these these guys. I Lots mean, of them, I do. Yeah, I do. And they have they get married, they have kids, and so you've been so to a lot of weddings, I'd say. A lot of weddings. Okay. Baptisms, divorces. <laughs> Starting at small forward, standing six foot one and six eighths, Kyle Ben. Tell him your weight. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was in communion with the spirit of the game. And most importantly, after some modelos and tacos, we were finally invited into the cathedral. And it's always important to tithe when you visit a house of worship. Luckily, I'm always flush with cash. Is that a two or is that a three? And overlooking it all is the most prominent player in the history of this state. The patron saint of the touch pass. The hick from French Lick who could conquer worlds with a quick slick flick. Larry Legend. They say that his game tape is a part of Indiana's public school curriculum. They don't actually say that, but they probably should. I'm sure they want to. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Bird. The fact that Terre Haute has featured prominently in the lives of two gargantuan basketball icons, two monoliths of hoop, is absolutely wild. The first is John Wooden, AKA the Wizard of Westwood. The second, obviously, is Larry Bird. And the fact that he buoyed this program to the national championship game in 1979 is really only rivaled by what Stephen Curry nearly did at Davidson. When you watch some great players from the past, there's a certain contextual pat on the head that comes with the era that they played in. You watch them bebop around the court and you think, cute, but no way that would fly today. Because of how much of his game was predicated on quick read, decision making, and how little was based on playing off the dribble, I sincerely do not think that this is the case with Bird. His awareness of the geometry of ball movement was almost supernatural. His face-up game was lethal and dynamic, and he recognized how the floor was moving at all times and was skilled enough to exploit it at all times. Snowfall hurried us out of Terre Haute. We'd had big plans to hop over to Kokomo to see Flory Badunga, the pogo big who's committed to Kansas and Bill's self, but the Arctic squall stranded us at the Sheraton. Our goals would have to stay local. I don't know that we're at the right place. Luckily for all of the high school field houses and college hoops lore, Indy is also the home to a long tenured professional team that happened to be hosting NBA All-Star Weekend. But Pacer optimism is stronger than it's been in quite some time. And that's because Indiana managed to pry Tyrese Halliburton away from the Kings. A surefire square one piece as a blossoming superstar scorer and playmaker. I think that Caitlin Cooper is the definitive analytic voice of the Pacers, and her subscription site, Basketball She Wrote, is arguably the most incisive coverage of any single team across the NBA. You know, sometimes I'll observe people ask you, like, why you're covering the Pacers, though. Like, I've seen someone ask you that question. You seemed a little annoyed, fair to say. Are you annoyed by that question when people ask you that? It's twofold. Like, it's really flattering that I have people from other fan bases be like, oh, get out of the mini Midwest, and like, you would be getting well, so India's much- a small market team. The Pacers yeah. haven't done anything yeah. wrong. Yeah, like, you would be getting so much more attention if you wrote about the Knicks or if you wrote about the Lakers, and that might be true, but also, like, because there aren't a lot of people covering this team, I'm not sure if my work would have stood out as much because there would have been a lot more people covering the New York Knicks and doing X's and O's content. So, because I have been in the Midwest, and also just, I grew up here. I grew up a fan of Indiana Pacers. People know that, like, Jermaine O'Neal was my favorite player. I bought DVDs of Jermaine O'Neal talking about his post footwork, and I would go to open <laughs> gyms and I would work on this. So, it means something to me that people know, like, you know, I am a Hoosier, I grew up here, and when I cover this team, it's a team that I've been watching for a really long time, so. Learning that Caitlin is the daughter of a high school coach and that she consumed a ton of Jermaine O'Neal tape is the least surprising thing that I've heard in a long time. You know, I feel like your your sort of like saturation in the basketball media landscape has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Would you say so? 
Yeah, I mean, a big part of that, to be completely honest, is the fact that Tyrese Halliburton got traded here. He's a very unique franchise player star, and that I think he's fairly online. And he reads a lot, he just loves basketball, so the fact that he's been as generous as he has with his platform has really been able to get what I've tried to do off the ground, but also showcase my work to other people. He's done shout outs when Indy Cornrows got shut down, he shared my work and said, like, look, she has an elite basketball mind she, she's talking about. He's talked about me on JJ's podcast a few times. So I think that that kind of turned the corner and getting more people to see my work and hopefully, you know, get more eyeballs on it. So I think that was kind of the turn. I've always thought that a player's play style is a fairly accurate read on who they are as a person. Halliburton is engaged and bright and hyper-conscious of the impact that his choices have on his environment. Yeah, I mean, he's just so inclusive, and I think that in part, he's just wired to be a pass first. It's almost there's games where you can watch him, and now clearly he's dealing with a hamstring injury. But there's spots within every game where you're like, he could have been more selfish there. That could be a shot for you. And it's almost like a surprise when it is the reverse of that. It's time to head to Hinkle Fieldhouse, the home of Butler basketball and one of the more iconic hoop venues in the world. Field houses are a staple of the culture here, and along those lines, it doesn't get any more iconic than Hinkle Fieldhouse, the gym where Jimmy Chipwood laid his master stroke. The gym where Brad Stevens and Gordon Hayward led Butler to national prominence. There's a mesmerizing vibe in here, and oh my God, there's Rick Patino. From Hinkle, we hurry to the Hi-Fi for a live pod taping with the boys from Ringer NBA group chat. Hello and welcome to Group Chat Live. I am Justin Barrier. This is Big Waz. Hey. What up, what up, what up? What up? That's Rob Mahoney. Hey guys, what's going on? And that's Jay Powell over there. Hello. Oh, yeah. The fourth chair of people. So, uh, you all agreed that the Pacers had a 0% chance of winning the championship. Now that you're an idiot, do oh. you stand by that opinion? <laughs> wow. I know you don't. <laughs> well, it's tough because Halliburton's injury specifically, I mean, you need your hamstrings regardless. I don't know if you guys have ever pulled your hamstrings. It's the... <laughs> I had a bad CrossFit exercise one time and I like couldn't drive home because I couldn't push the gas pedal down. My oh, you were was, CrossFitting? I tried it, it wasn't for me. The Halliburton ceiling question is a good one, I think. Because we, we did this ranking project at the Ringer. Mm-hmm. I think Halliburton was what, the 13th ranked player in the NBA? Oh, right, on behind, right, LeBron, right behind LeBron James, 13th ranked player in the NBA. So that's where he is right now. He's only getting better. He's only getting more sophisticated one-on-one. He's going to be a better defender as he ages into his career. I don't think it's crazy to say he could be a top five player in the league. I don't think it's crazy to say that he's going to be like 100 percent. He will have a face of his career if it's not already. And this year might be a little bit of a stretch just because of the competition. But like he's going to have a phase where he's on MVP ballots. I think he's going to be that good. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to need a towel over here. Probably some all surface cleaner. <laughs> Indianapolis is an up and coming culinary hotspot. I've never been here when the weather hasn't served a soul crushing Blade Runner vibe, but I promise you, it's lovely. You might caffeinate yourself with a meticulous touch of Amberson coffee and grocer, or savor the world famous shrimp cocktail at St. Elmo's, or chomp on a delicious morning time miracle at Milk Tooth. It's hard to go wrong here. I could do chilies though. Thank yeah. You. What's your favorite chilies thing? I really like the the chicken tenders. Those crispy chicken thing. I think it's the name. Of course, there's the the awesome blossom. Baby yeah. back ribs. I am ready when you are, y'all. I think we're gonna need to do a triple dipper. Yeah. A state with a hoops history this rich, this storied, this extensive requires as big a data download as possible. 
So we stopped by the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, which is in Newcastle, Indiana. Also home to the Steve Alford All-American Inn. You cannot be truly successful without peace of mind. We must not be too concerned about things over which we have no control. It was in 1891 when James A. Naismith invented the game of basketball for his physical education class. He cashes that, and they are going to win the state championship, folks. Here comes uh, Muncie Central. Looks like a half quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go over there. Although Purdue has hogged the headlines lately, it's hard to deny that the state's basketball identity rises and falls with the state's flagship public school. This place looks like it could fit in seamlessly in DC. Clean lines and classic, timeless architecture everywhere you look. Even their graphic design conveys warmth without whimsy, powerful lettering that stands and weathers the passing of time. Without knowing records or recent outcomes, you'd have no idea that this is a program that's struggled to stay consistently near the top since their polarizing titan, their iconically fierce leader, their general, who led this program to three national titles in one 11-year span, was removed from power back in 1997. There have definitely been plateaus, some at my expense, moments where they had the full attention of the sport, but each one seems to end up surrounded by deep valleys. Still, hope springs eternal. These people stand for their team, and the Hoosiers' ethos and brand stand undeniably as a reflection of night, rigid discipline, and process powering a pursuit of perfection. The ritual at Assembly Hall is mesmerizing, especially to a filthy Kentuckian like me. But it felt like going into a restaurant that had seen their heyday with classic dishes that were known throughout the world while struggling to enter a new era. How do you weaponize the power of a legacy brand while staying with the times? How does a program remain fierce and modern without compromising their identity? A lot of people point to the exit of Kelvin Sampson, the coach who's revitalized Houston basketball and ushering them into the Big 12 Conference as an inflection point that depicts this dilemma. Sampson was hit by the NCAA for texting a recruit during a dead period where it was against the rules. The rule was changed a short time later, but Sampson was still fired from the job. Zach Osterman is an IU grad and a prominent voice around the program. You can say that those were dumb rules. You can point out that they got erased later on, whatever. He still broke them and he didn't need to break them. And that's, I guess, the thing that's always been sort of strange to me is just kind of a neutral observer that is, is, you know, you could understand why someone might feel like they need to, you know, bend some edges and cut some corners at Oklahoma, but he didn't need to do that at Indiana. And, you know, the fact that he, he did just at the scale that he did is just sort of, you know, it's kind of one of those things where if, if I, you know, if I got a bunch of speeding tickets and the judge said, don't do that again or you're going to jail, I can't, I can't walk into the courtroom and complain about the speed limit. Mike Woodson seemed like a central enough figure to stabilize all of the important factors. He played four years at IU under Bob Knight. He coached in the NBA and he's networked in all of the right places to draw talent. This team lost all of their key pieces from a year ago, but in the transfer era, the patience for rebuilding is lower than ever. From the outside, I wondered if Woodson's stability raised their floor without impacting their ceiling. I wondered how quickly their reserves of patience would deplete. Is this Tom Crean all over again? I'm not trying to damn Tom with faint praise or anything. Tom got three years of, of historic losing to rebuild to a place where obviously Indiana wound up you know, number one in the country, won the Big Ten, probably didn't quite go as far as it could have in the NCAA tournament, but still looked like that kind of program again. You know, Archie Miller only got four years, period. And we're here in year three, and Mike Woodson's had a perfectly healthy first couple years, and there's some frustration already. And some of that's justified, some of it's probably not, but I think it's also just reflective of the, you know, the, the further you kind of get away from it, the more, you know, the, the less patience there's probably going to be. Talking to IU fans, that doesn't seem to be the vibe. And then there's a percentage on both sides. There's no, extreme on no. both ends. Both sides. There's no, extreme on no. both ends. It's no secret that I am a dyed-in-the-wool wildcat. I should despise these people. It's in my programming. Joby Hall once said that he wouldn't piss up Bob Knight's ass if his bowels were on fire. What was that? After everything that I've seen, would I withhold in the same way? I don't think I would. I would definitely put out the fire. I need a trip to Chili's to contemplate everything that I've seen. I have to say, it's been an eye-opening and heart-softening trip. I'm a little bit rattled. Are these people savages? Are they so different from me? 
We might sound the drums of war just for the sport of it, but I think it's a no on both counts. If anything, I feel comfortable here. One era of basketball in Indiana as we knew it, lionized in pop culture and memorialized on the stoic walls and in the concourses of their cathedrals and museums, might be over. Growth and urban expansion mean the state tournament is no longer wide open. Commercialization of the sport means that compensation for the individual is inextricable from the team concept. So we adapt and we move on. Aside from pooping their pants in the tournament repeatedly, Purdue has a player of the year and is thriving under Matt Painter. Josh Schertz and Robbie Avila have the house that Bird built humming again. Miss Vicky is on top of her game. Tyrese Halliburton has Pacer fans envisioning a bright future. The why of Indiana hoop passion might go unspoken, but it's anything but dormant or backward. I'm seeing their history like a tailwind, sailing them toward whatever comes next. Let me know if you agree. You ready? Yeah, man. God. Just, okay.